Um, hi, my name is Rachel Boynton. I'm a documentary filmmaker. I made a film called Big Men, and I, uh, it's, about, it's about the quest for oil in West Africa, ostensibly, but it's really a film about capitalism. Um, and just as an introduction for like, sort of how I think, I'm, I'm really interested in making films about things that I think are sort of fundamental to how the world works now. I like the idea of creating something that you could look at in like 100 years and have some sort of like treasure box um, that shows us a reflection of how we are. So it's not really a film that's... I'm not an advocacy filmmaker... I'm not somebody who's trying to get across a point that you know, I want everyone to believe. It's really more for me uh, trying to reflect sort of fundamental truths about how the world works today. So they have the trailer to show you. This is Copter 4. We read you Copter 4. I should be touching down in just a few minutes. This field is going to be worth a lot, a lot of money. A flowing oil. A flowing oil. An American company has discovered a massive new oil field off the coast of West Africa. We're looking at a $11 billion development on a billion barrels, net to us, $2.2 billion, net to the company. This is a substantial oil project. Cosmos strategy was clearly higher risk, but also much higher reward. The work you are coming to do in Ghana merits Thank respect. You. We know how important it is for the country, and uh, we intend to do a really good job. So Excellent. you're going to be you're going to be proud of us. We're going to be proud of you. We're going to be paying out on the pipe. Go about five percent. There's a lot of money at stake. People's focus gets more intense, and more people will look to get a piece of it. This attack highlights the vulnerability of the oil infrastructure here. Opposition leaders declared the winner of Ghana's presidential election. The previous government was nice to Cosmos. Certain things will have to change. The goal is to maximize profit. But can you get the cash? Or will there be so many other people and entities involved that you can't earn a profit? I started making this film, I didn't know anyone in the oil business. I didn't know anyone in Africa, uh, in Morocco maybe, but certainly not West Africa. And so I started by buying a plane ticket to Lagos, Nigeria, <clears throat> and I had this idea that I was going to get access to an American oil company specifically operating in the Niger Delta and film them in the context of this militancy that was going on at the time. I ended up getting access to an American oil company in Ghana, and then I did this parallel story. It's really the story of two places. Uh, it follows an American oil company called Cosmos Energy that discovers and develops the first oil field in the history of Ghana. And simultaneously, over the course of six years, I was filming in the Niger Delta, principally with a group of militants who were blowing up pipelines and demanding more money for their region. It is really a film about money. And I think when I think about energy, for me, it's about money. Um, and it's about profit. And the, the film actually starts with a quote from uh, Milton Friedman, uh, which I will summarize the quote, but it's basically, what, what person do you know that isn't motivated by greed? All, all societies are run on greed. Basically, he's Mr. Greed is Good, for those of you who don't know who Milton Friedman <laughs> is. Um, and, and I started with that quote for a specific reason, because I believe that that philosophy, that idea that uh, individual, maximum individual profit. Um, it is the philosophy that runs our world today. And uh, I don't believe that you can address a question, any question about energy without really coming to terms with the notion that our, our world, th 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 we were talking about this last night, that the whole idea of the five, I hope I'm doing something for your talk, but the whole idea of the 5,000 uh, pound life is actually a collective idea. Yeah which is sort of scary, right, for those of us who were brought up in the, this country, like, fearing 
fearing the red and, you know, hide under your uh, <laughs> tables should the bomb be dropped. But it, 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 we live in a society where talking about collective interests in America uh, is really verboten. And yet, when you talk about this, you're talking about a collective solution. And there's a fundamental, um, there's a conflict there. And I, I don't think we can talk about collective solutions, really, honestly, without really addressing the reality that we live in a world that's entirely run by the idea that individual maximum profit is what should be running the world. In fact, it's what ultimately leads to the greater good. That's the philosophy in which we, we operate. And sort of that's the, that's the fundamental driving force behind the questions in the film. It's really a film about human nature. So I don't know if I've asked a question. Oh, I, I, I brought something to read, actually, um, to spark debate. Uh, this, is, this is not fully in the film. I, I printed out a piece of transcript uh, from an interview that I did. Uh, the guy who spoke, his name is Cherry Triopoku. He is a, a member of the board of directors for the Ghanaian National Petroleum Company. And I was sort of trying to get him to summarize my film for me when I did this interview. Um, and I was asking him about why is there conflict? When oil is found, why do you think conflict results? And this was his result, or this is his answer in summary. He said, people suddenly see an opportunity for wealth. And without a certain discipline, without a certain vision, without a certain solidarity, you could end up like rats trying to climb out of a cage. And he goes on and he says, and I ask him to explain it more. He says, you've got a crowd, you've got a room full of hungry people, starving people. You throw in a loaf of bread. Everybody's going for it. Everybody's trying to find a way to get to it. It's not the case that the automatic response is for people to sit down and say, okay, how do we divide up the loaf, loaf most effectively? People representing different ethnic groups, even state institutions, start scram scrambling about <clears throat> what's our foothold in this business? How do we ensure that some of this resource flows our way instead of to that other institution? So it's not about oil per se. It's about sudden wealth and the structures and the culture you need to have in place to manage that in a way that benefits everybody rather than just being grabbed by the most suc successful elite group. So, I, I'm, I'm not, any response to this question? I, I, there was one thing in the trailer, um, uh, and I wasn't quite sure who, who it was. It was clearly uh, some, uh, somebody in the finance end of this saying... Jeffrey Harris from Warburg Pincus. Okay, so he was saying something along the lines of, as I understood it, this is unraveling, there's more people getting involved, and our profit is, is, is going down, or at some point we may make no profit. I mean, uh, I'm taking as the theme, which is something I think is pretty true that, that uh, as you describe it, um, wealth is a, a transformation of energy. You pull the oil out and essentially you're turning it into to, to, to various forms of, of wealth. Well, for them, oil is money. And, and, and Jeffrey talks in the film about what he's created, right. you know, by um, creating the wealth, really. So... Now I want to know. I do have to see the movie, but um, do they decide to go ahead with the investment? Oh no! They they he put in eight hundred million dollars, and they the they ultimately they'll make billions. I think yeah, at the end of the day. But the question for me, yeah. I mean, when you're talking about and maybe in terms of translating this into what all of you do, you're all these visionaries, right? You are. You're you're these visionaries who are trying to envision a, a new way of doing things, a new way of going forward. And a lot of the questions that you're confronting are collective questions, because you're talking about co collectives, you're talking about cities, you're talking about buildings even, they're collectives, right? And yet, for me, a fundamental part of the problem when we're talking about questions around energy has to do with the fundamental individual motivations toward individual benefit. It is very rare... It, in our society, in, I can only speak to America, but for people to come together and decide on the collective good, you know, the path of collective good as opposed to the path of maximum individual profit, unless we feel pain, right? Like we're in a, t a time of war and we're suffering. Or, and this is where movies, in my opinion, come in, unless there's some kind of dream, unless there's an ideal, a dream that we can envision and that we, we want to achieve. You know, it needs, you really kind of need one or the other. 
and you guys, I kind of see you as sort of the dreamers. Um, uh, but I do wonder how you go about executing these visions, given the context that I'm talking about. I find it really interesting. First of all, I bow down to you. That's, I, I can hardly wait to see this film. But, you know, this discussion about the collective, I think, is really key. Some years ago, I invited Gru Brundtland, uh, who was the author of the, the Brundtland Commission and therefore um, where sustainable development came from uh, the commission that she ran from 1983 to 1987. Uh, there was always an understanding that sustainability and environmental need related to the collective. And for some reason, of course, this is even more true of architecture, we've defined it as something that's about the self. You know, we talk about a sustainable building, we talk about a sustainable community, we talk about a sustainable lifestyle. So we're always reading it in terms of ourself, never thinking that the collective actually includes all of these different parts of the world. Yeah. Except I, th I think that there is no like the collective. You know, I, I think um, there's there are collectives, um, and and they're always going to be antagonistic with each other in some way, and that there's going to be conflict. And um, I mean, it's nice to be talking about collectivism in the time center. Well, that's that's kind of surprising, but um, I think certainly things like scarcity and surplus and the way that they you know. Um, the importance, the, the important effects they have on, on, on people's behavior with respect to energy. Um, you know, the, the need, another way of talking about need is poverty, yeah. And, and in fact, things like scarcity and surplus aren't kind of accidents either. You know, they're held in place by very, very violent things sometimes. And, you know, people go to war to protect their surplus, you know, and, and, and to protect sites of resource extraction. And, and they, they, you know, land is dispossessed. You know, this is a kind of bloody history as well behind uh, behind energy, and so, so I think it's important. Um, I think the technical conversations and the conversations around markets and 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 the mobilising people politically are, are, of course, very very important. But we shouldn't lose sight of the the kind of history and the background of, of these things, which are brutal. Mm -hmm. you know? 